Along comes, there's a lot of, Congress is paralyzed. In 1849, when they meet, they can't even elect a Speaker of the House until 100 ballots or something. Along comes Henry Clay one of, the, of Kentucky, one of the great politicians of this time. Now, this shows you how politics then is different from politics now. What was Henry, Henry Clay had been in political office for 50 years. I mean, he started out in 1799 in Kentucky, and now it's 1849, 1850, and there he is, senator from Kentucky. What is he known? And he is loved. People loved Henry Clay. Abraham Lincoln loved Henry Clay. He said, he's my ideal of a statesman. He was a great hero. To, all right, why? What was his great, you know, <coughs> moniker? The, he was called the Great Compromiser. Can you imagine a politician today running and saying, I'm the Great Compromiser? <laughs> That's not what the electorate wants to hear, it doesn't appear. We do say we want compromise, and then we just vote for the most extreme candidates who will not compromise on anybody. But Clay is the great compromiser. You'd think a guy would like to run on a principle, like I stand for, no, no, I just stand for compromise. I don't care what it is. <laughs> All right, Clay had been the architect of the Missouri Compromise. He'd been the architect of the compromise that ended the nullification crisis. And now he comes forward with the compromise of 1850. Okay, so. Here's the compromise. One, admit California as a slave state, a free state, pardon me, as a free state. Two, basically popular sovereignty for the rest of the Mexican session. Congress will not say anything about slavery in those other areas. No Wilmot proviso. Uh, there's a stuff about Texas, um, uh, particularly assuming the state debt. Texas owed a lot of money uh, to, when it, uh, to various people, and um, they didn't want to pay, and so they wanted the federal government to uh, pay their bills for them. So that's what's going to happen here. Abolition of the slave trade, but not slavery itself, in Washington, D.C. Abolition has been fighting for the abolition of slavery in the nation's capital since the 1830s, and there were quite a few in Congress, not abolitionists at all, who thought it was a little unseemly to have the auctioning of slaves within sight of the White House and the Capitol. There were slave markets, slave auctions, and for the capital of the empire of freedom, as Jefferson called it, or empire of liberty, it didn't it seemed a little incongruous. And foreign diplomats sort of commented on this. So they, Clay said, all right, let's get rid of the slave trade. People can't buy and sell slaves in Washington anymore, but not abolish it. And then, of course, this new fugitive slave, a much more powerful fugitive slave law. Now, there followed a, the, one of the great, uh, there's Clay before the Senate. I'm critical of politicians in general, but back then, they were serious people. This, the Senate debate of February, March, 1850, was one of the great political debates in American history, where you had powerful speeches on all sides by very, very learned, important people. Um, Clay gave an impassioned speech for the Union. In early March, Senator Mason of Virginia read the last speech of Calhoun, who was dying and would soon die a few weeks later. And Calhoun was too weak. He was wheeled into the Senate. He could not give his speech, and Mason gave it. Uh, and Mason, it said, it is opposed to compromise. No compromise with the, the North must yield to the South, he said. And slavery must be allowed and protected in all the territories. I have believed from the first, said Calhoun, that the agitation of the subject of slavery, if not prevented by some timely measure, will end in disunion. Um, and California must come in as a slave state, not as a free state, he said. And a few weeks later, Cal uh, Calhoun died, leaving behind a fragmentary draft of a constitutional amendment providing for two presidents, one from the North and one from the South, each able to veto any congressional legislation. This is absurd, but it's an attempt to build into the political system a guarantee of the defense of the rights and the, of, of the South, i.e. slavery. So Calhoun's giving you the no compromise, the South must get its way. Four days after him, Daniel Webster, the great senator from Massachusetts, gives his famous March 7th speech, 
Webster, coming from Massachusetts, had been strongly anti-slavery, supporting the Wilmot Proviso. Now he says, no, I'm giving that up. Compro I support the compromise. He starts with his famous uh, line, you know, uh, Mr. President, I wish to speak today not as a Massachusetts man, not as a northern man, but as an American. I speak today for the preservation of the Union. Hear me for my cause. These guys understood rhetoric. They don't anymore in Washington. You ever heard Harry Reid? I'm talking about senators. Harry Reid, Ted Cruz, he thinks reading Dr. Seuss on, aloud is, is <laughs> rhetoric. I mean, back then they understood what a speech was. Webster even said, if, the so if it's necessary to have this new fugitive slave law to conciliate the South, I will accept it. So this is the voice of the older generation for compromise. Four days later, the new generation speaks, and that is William Seward of New York. His speech is famous or infamous in the South for his declaration that there is a higher law, a higher law than the Constitution. This is the language of abolitionism now in the Senate. What is that higher law? It's the law of morality. That's what we should be following. Forget about the Constitution. Yes, the Constitution says send back fugitive slaves, but the higher law says no, we cannot, we cannot do that. Now that, of course, is totally unacceptable to the South. If the North is going to say it's a higher law, what use is any of these constitutional guarantees? But Seward goes further. He, he says, you know, there cannot be an equilibrium. He ridicules Calhoun's idea that you can maintain this equilibrium between North and South. The North is growing. The North is thriving. The North is on the side of history. The South must yield eventually. That's Seward's position. In, in the beginning of July, uh, General Taylor dies in office after a big Fourth of July party, which was too much for him. And, um, <laughs> Uh, and he is succeeded by one of the presidents from New York State, not the most widely known, Millard Fillmore from Buffalo. And um, Fillmore is much more pro-compromise than Taylor, and with the support of Fillmore, the Compromise of 1850, after a series of very complicated maneuvers, passes through the Senate. But it's not in Clay's version. Clay had put all these measures in one bill. And that bill goes nowhere because anybody who opposes one part of it votes against it. It's then picked up by Stephen A. Douglas, the new senator from Illinois, and piloted to success piece by piece. Douglas realized you can't pass this as one measure, but if you break it up, you can create a majority for each measure. So the fugitive slave law, you create a majority with Southern votes and a few Northerners. The admission of California, you create a majority with Northern votes and a few Southerners. But there is no, in other words, there's no compromise majority, but you can make, you can create majorities for each part of the compromise. So, this is the Compromise of 1850. Basically, admission of California as a free state, popular sovereignty for the rest of the Mexican session, abolition of, sl of the slave trade in Washington, D.C., and a new fugitive slave law.